So tonight is listed as a introduction to meditation class. So I'll be making some fairly basic introductory remarks about what we're doing. I'll also include some more advanced material because otherwise why are we here? Um, uh, we're not just here to get a little bit calmer if that's what you want, then there's a bar just down the street. Um, you'll get a bit calmer, it won't bring any wisdom, um, but you'll get calmer. So we're not just here to get calm. Um, if you want uh, just peacefulness, then there's, there's millions of ways that you can become more peaceful. But that's only a, a fraction of what we're trying to do in, in Buddhist meditation practice. So ultimately what we're aiming at with meditation practice is liberating insight. Uh, we're aiming at wisdom which will pierce right through uh, our deepest misperceptions and delusions about the nature of the mind. Uh, we're, we're seeking to develop the uh, incisive penetrating wisdom uh, that allows us to um, completely reorient um, our perceptions of the world. Uh, our experience of the world. So this starts with the recognition that there's something fundamentally wrong with how we've been approaching our experience. Um, so it's not just a minor thing like, like things are mostly good but I could be a little bit happier. It's, it's not that. Uh, it's recognizing that we've got a complete uh, distortion of reality going on here. It's a recognition that we're seeing, we're seeing the world completely backwards. Uh, and that so far we don't have any clue what to do about this. Um, so Buddhist practice starts with the recognition that we don't just have a little bit of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And it's going to be revolutionary. It's not just like a, a little tweak. Um, it's a complete reworking uh, of how we're experiencing reality. Um, so, uh, usually we start with um, talking in some banal terms about uh, discontent and discomfort and such things. Talking about how we experience discomfort in various ways from moment to moment. Uh, how there's a pervasive feeling of discontent in the mind which is produced by uh, our desires and aversions. Um, and how overcoming those desires and aversions can lead to happiness, true happiness. Uh, and this should be a relatively familiar formula. So this is the what's called the Four Noble Truths, which is the foundation of Buddhist theory. Um, so who here has heard of the Four Noble Truths? Pretty much everyone. Um, so not surprising. This is one of the foundation stones of, of Buddhist philosophy. Um, and uh, But again, on its surface, uh, if we if we don't investigate too deeply on its surface, it looks like that that just that little tweak of like okay, too much desire makes me unhappy, so I should try to reduce my desire, so I'll be a bit more happy. We can think about it in those terms, but what that's missing is that the root of desire is deeply uh, a, this deeply rooted misperception of the world, this complete failure to see the world for what it is. Um, and it's not just that we don't see the world for what it is, it's that we see the world for what it's not. Uh, it's that we've, we've built up a complete misunderstanding about the world. So there's, uh, there's three ways of approaching this. Actually, I mean, there's infinite variety of ways of approaching it, of course. But there's, there's three basic ways that we can start to look at this. Um, so one is recognizing that uh, we have a tendency to, uh, well, first off, we have a tendency to be spacey. We have a tendency to not see the world clearly. Um, so we have a tendency to go through life with a somewhat vague, hazy mind. Who here experiences this from time to time, a vague, hazy mind? Who experiences it pretty much all the time, be honest? Okay. Uh, so the very first thing then is recognizing that we have absolutely no hope of developing wisdom as long as the mind is hazy and unclear. 
Um, so the first thing is developing sharp, clear awareness. Uh, so this then is is mindfulness practice. It's it's mindfulness at its most simple form. Uh, it's just developing clear awareness moment to moment. And actually, when the Buddha speaks about mindfulness, that's that's only a fraction of what he talks about. So it's, again, it's only the beginning. Um, the next thing is recognizing that we are uh, we normally live in a world which we think of as composed of objects of distinct separate objects like there's a person here which is a distinct object on a blanket which is a distinct object on a floor which is a distinct object in a room which is a distinct object so thinking of it in terms of discrete objects uh, and thinking of the mind similarly also in terms of discrete objects like there is uh, a memory, which is a discrete object. There is a uh, an emotion. Um, perhaps boredom might be what you're experiencing while the monk is talking. So boredom is a distinct object uh, happening inside a mind, which is a distinct object. So it's it's thinking of the world as distinct objects, and we presume uh, some kind of ongoing stability to these objects. We assume that the floor is basically the same now as it was a few minutes ago. Uh, we assume that this body is basically the same now as it was a few minutes ago. Uh, we assume that our mind is basically the same now as it was a few minutes ago. Uh, so this is the, the basic assumption that we run on. We run on the assumption that there are solid, stable, continuously existing objects, and the world is composed of a bunch of these solid, stable, continuously existing objects. Does anybody actually believe that intellectually? Anyone believe that? No? Okay, great. Then we're off to a great start. We at least intellectually recognize that this is a massively flawed way of experiencing reality. Nonetheless, who here still experiences reality in that way? Pretty much everyone? Okay, great. So, we recognize that our experience of reality is massively flawed. It's completely wrong. So what do we do about it? What can we do to tangibly change uh, this discord between our well-developed intellectual framework of Buddhist theory, namely the recognition that everything is uh, impermanent, uh, unstable, insubstantial, constantly changing, uh, hollow, empty, void, lacking any self-existence. So starting from that recognition, the recognition that there are no separate objects. There are no permanent objects. There is nothing which has any ongoing stable existence whatsoever. So starting with that, that idea, how do we change our experience? So this is where meditation practice becomes extremely important, uh, extremely relevant. Uh, because if we just think about these things, then nothing really changes. Um, so, for example, there was a um, scholar by name of Alan Watts. Who's heard of Alan Watts? Few people? Okay. So Alan Watts was a scholar who studied uh, Buddhism and Taoism and, and such things. And he developed a very thorough intellectual framework uh, for Buddhism and, and particularly for Zen Buddhism and for uh, the, the concept of emptiness. But he himself did not practice meditation and did not follow Buddhist precepts and did not live in accordance with the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and accordingly, he was an absolute disaster. Um, so I've, I've spoken with his daughters and they've talked about how Alan Watts was a complete disaster of a human being from uh, his early childhood until his death. He was an absolute wreck. So he had a, a great intellectual framework for Buddhist theory but he did not practice it. He did not live it. So nothing changed. He was born a wreck, he died a wreck. He was born a disaster, he died a disaster. So just 
thinking about these things doesn't do us any good. Um, we need to work to uh, radically alter our basic experience. So through meditation practice, we start with developing the incisiveness of mind. So, so turning the mind from the blunt instrument that we normally have um, into a, a scalpel, uh, making it into a sharp, precise instrument, which we can use. So we start with developing mindfulness and concentration. Uh, so clear, sharp, detailed awareness, coupled with powerful, intense focus. Um, we do this so that we can pierce through the subconscious mind. Um, so normally we're, we're just not particularly aware of what's going on. Uh, we're only aware of the most coarse, subtle, obvious layers of our experience. So we can talk about the subtle layers by which we create a flawed perception of reality, but we don't have any experience of it until we develop powerful mindfulness and strong concentration. So this cannot be ignored. So some people say, oh, you don't really need strong concentration. You can just practice insight directly. To that I say, good luck. Let me know how it goes. So far, everyone I've talked to who has done that has failed miserably despite trying for decades. Um, your experience may be different, but this is not how the Buddha ever talked about it. So the Buddha spoke about three primary ways of developing the path. Um, so either first developing strong concentration, then developing insight, um, which historically has been the way most commonly taught in Theravada Buddhism. Second is first developing insight, then after you uh, practice insight for a little bit, so trying to practice insight meditation requires holding the mind relatively still for a period of time. So you'll start to get a little bit of concentration. So after practicing insight for a little bit, then you focus on concentration. Then when your concentration is strong, you return to practicing insight. The third way he spoke about was to simultaneously develop concentration and insight. So all three of these you'll notice contain concentration as a critical component, so it cannot be ignored. Without strong concentration, we will never develop strong insight. So, uh, starting with mindfulness and concentration. Uh, and uh, the other important thing to start with in the beginning is noticing how the uh, tendencies we have towards liking and disliking mm, cause the mind to continuously waver. Uh, so we're constantly moving towards what we like and moving away from what we dislike. We're constantly trying to get what we want and avoid what we don't want. And we're doing this moment by moment. Uh, and even when we're not physically moving towards what we like, we're physically avoiding what we dislike, we're constantly moving with our mind. Uh, so we're constantly gravitating with our mind towards what we like and away from what we dislike. So it's recognizing the instability that creates. Uh, so again, coming back to uh, the metaphor of the mind as a scalpel. So developing mindfulness and concentration uh, is like sharpening and, and focusing the mind uh, to be like a scalpel. So if you're going to do surgery with that scalpel and your hand is constantly shaking, are you going to be a particularly effective surgeon? You've got a great instrument, it's really sharp. It's got a great fine point on it, really good sharp scalpel. But your hand won't hold still, it's constantly wavering. Um, and now you're going to do brain surgery. Sound like a good plan? Not so much. So we need to, to tame the wavering of the mind. Uh, so developing equanimity so that the mind is not constantly veering into liking and disliking. So that we, when we encounter pleasant things, the mind does not shake. When we encounter painful things, the mind does not shake. The mind stays completely on track. Uh, it does what we tell it to do without trying to uh, avoid the painful things and steer towards the pleasant things. The, the mind stays on track. So this is equanimity. Now, the mind that is not swayed by pleasure or pain. 
the mind that is not swayed by liking and disliking. Um, so this is put really beautifully in a, an ancient Zen text um, from 6th century China or so called the Xin Xin Ming, which starts off with the phrase, uh, the way is easy for those who have no preferences. So this is equanimity. It's talking about the, the practice of equanimity. So the mind which has no preference, it doesn't lean towards liking or disliking. It's not swayed by liking or disliking. So mindfulness, concentration, and equanimity. Um, so this is, uh, again, this is the very basic practice that I was recommending at the beginning. So focusing on your body, and particularly on your hands, feeling it intensely with clear, sharp detail, uh, and with contentment, with a content mind. So right there is mindfulness, concentration, and equanimity. Uh, and actually just developing that simple practice. Uh, if we really wanted to be honest about what we're doing, we would be practicing that for several hours a day, every day, for weeks, at least, uh, before moving on to anything more complicated. Mm. Otherwise, mm, we're not exactly wasting our time, but we're unlikely to get, to get particularly significant results. You'll still get some results. You'll notice that you get calmer, you get more peaceful. Your life becomes more rich, more detailed. You're not uh, as bothered by the things that used to bother you. Um, when people say rude things, you don't get upset. When you stub your toe, you don't, you're not bothered and so on. So you'll notice that, that your life improves significantly just by doing this simple practice. Even for a few minutes a day, things will improve significantly. Uh, but again, that's, that's not what Buddhism is for. Um, so Buddhism is not just a, a replacement for Valium. Um, so Buddhism is meant to completely revolutionize our experience from the ground up. Um, so the, uh, the next step then is when the mind is sharp, focused, steady, and clear. then we can start to alter our experience. Uh, so through recognizing that the appearance of solidity, the appearance of stability is something we are adding to our experience. It's not innately there. It's not inherently there. It's something extra we are adding. Which means we can stop adding it at any time. So take your hand. Uh, so normally we think of the hand as having a sharp line, uh, a sharp outline, clearly defined outline. And actually, if you're the, the sort of person who keeps up on modern science, you'll know that this is utterly ridiculous. There is no sharp outline to the hand. Actually, the hand blurs uh, indistinguishably with everything around it. In fact, everything blurs indistinguishably with everything around it. Um, so even speaking from the context of modern science, let alone from Buddhist theory, then we know that this is ridiculous, and yet it's our experience. But as we look more closely, as we closely examine the experience of the hand, um, so feeling the sensations closely, what we notice is that there is no sharply defined edge to the hand. Um, so there is this cloud of sensation uh, and even those sensations are, are constantly appearing and disappearing. Uh, so in any given moment, there's a particular set of sensations. The next moment, there's a completely different set of sensations. Um, so this, uh, when we look closely and we stop assuming that there is a solid unchanging object there, then we recognize that there's not a solid unchanging object there. The appearance of a solid unchanging object is something extra that we're creating. It's not actually there. 
So it's our habit to place the appearance of a solid object there, to draw the outline of a hand, so to speak. Uh, that's our habit. It's what we normally do. So let's stop doing it. So this is the instruction I was giving um, in the last few minutes of the meditation, uh, was to stop projecting the appearance of a solid object. Stop expecting there to be a solid, stable uh, object in the area of your hands. Stop expecting there to be hands there and just be open to what actually is going on, uh, which is this constant flux, this constant change, uh, this instability, this uh, field of insubstantiality. Like there's, there's nothing really there. Um, so it's not quite not quite correct to say that there's absolutely nothing there. But it's not quite correct to say that there's something solid and substantial there either. So it's opening up to this experience, which in the beginning is, is quite strange. It's quite peculiar. Uh, so often when people start to do this particular meditation, the, they find the mind recoils almost immediately. Almost immediately the mind pulls back. It's like, no. No, I'm not going to go there. That's too freaky. So what we're moving into is this experience of simultaneous existence and non-existence. Did I just lose anyone? Did I just go totally off the rails there? No? Okay. Are you just being shy to admit it? No? Okay, great. Um, so simultaneous existence and non-existence. So we can say, and, and again, this is a way of talking, uh, we can say that there both is a hand present here, and there's also not. Uh, there's something there, but there's also nothing there. Um, you can say that, um, uh, but the actual experience is something, something in between. Uh, so it's like uh, if we have black and we have white. So you can either say it's black or it's white, but the actual experience is gray. So normally we think either something exists or it doesn't exist. We think that's the only possibilities. Either there's a bell here or there's not a bell here. Those are the only possibilities. That's how we normally tend to think. But the actual experience is not the black or the white, it's gray. Uh, so simultaneous existence and non-existence. Even that's not, not precisely correct, but we can go with it for the time being. Um, so simultaneous existence and non-existence. So there's both mm, the appearance of a hand, the appearance of a solid object called a hand. There's also absolutely nothing there. Um, so what we're moving into then is relaxing our expectation of things being any particular way. This also requires that we release our deep set attachment to our body. Uh, so in order to allow or to open up to uh, this simultaneous existence and non-existence, it is necessary to open up to non-existence. It's necessary to open up to the possibility that this body might not exist, that there might actually not be a body here. And in order for that to be possible, then it's necessary to let go of our identification with the body as being who we are, as being what we are. If we think this body is me, there's absolutely no way we will allow ourselves to experience the non-existence of the body. Because that would be mm, destruction of something essential to ourself. It would be the destruction of part of our self-identity. Um, so it's relaxing that. It's, it's developing the willingness to allow the body to come to an end. The willingness to allow the body to cease to exist. Can we develop that willingness? And we're all still here in this room, by the way, so you don't need to worry about actually losing anything. Um, but developing the willingness to lose everything with absolute serenity. So being completely okay with this.
and noticing what happens when we allow that to be our experience. How does that change the character of the mind? So it's a sense of security which we start to notice. So this is much deeper than just that tranquil, relaxed feeling you get after sitting still for half an hour. So this is a feeling of fearlessness. It's the recognition that even if this body was destroyed, that would be totally fine. And noticing how much better that feels than the feeling of, I must keep this body and it must be perfectly healthy and it must be this and it must be that. Relaxing, it's like, actually it's okay, no big deal. The body can dissolve, the body can go away. Not a problem, totally fine. Whatever happens with the body, no big deal. Noticing how much better that feels. So believe it or not, that's the easy part of this meditation, the letting go of the body. Then we start getting into the really challenging stuff. Um, so letting go of the mind, letting go of the objects of mind in the beginning. So it's recognizing that uh, just as there's nothing solid or stable or continuous about the body, there's also nothing solid, stable or continuous about the mental objects. Um, thoughts, memories, ideas, emotions, and so on. There's absolutely nothing, nothing stable to be found there either. Uh, so in some sense, this is actually easier to recognize because the mind changes extremely quickly. Um, so recognizing the, the emptiness or the insubstantiality of, of mental objects is um, in some ways easier than with the body. More difficult is recognizing the, the emptiness, the insubstantiality of patterns of mind. So with the mind, we normally don't get caught on any particular object. Well, actually we do, we get, we get caught on particular mental objects all the time. Uh, but where we have a lot of difficulty is with the patterns of mind. Uh, so the ways we normally think, the ways we normally feel, uh, that's where we tend to get caught up in uh, a sense of self-identity, a sense of who we are and what we are, or rather who we think we are and what we think we are. Uh, and that's where we're not willing to allow things to change. It's, not willing, not where we're, it's where we're not willing to allow things to, to cease, uh, it's where we're not open to the possibility of, of things being otherwise, uh, or even completely absent. So, uh, it's recognizing the uh, rigidity of self-identity, uh, of thinking, I am clever, I am mm, foolish, I am spacey, I am creative, I am fill in the blank. I have a good memory, I have a bad memory. Uh, it's recognizing that whatever form of pattern we try to create out of our, our mental experiences, that pattern is itself impermanent, subject to change, insubstantial, not absolute, not eternal, not who we are. It's something which has no uh, solidity. Uh, it's something which is, is not, uh, it's not substantial. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something we can rely upon uh, as being who we are or what we are. It's not something we can rely upon to always be there uh, or to always be the same. Uh, so we start to relax our grip on the patterns uh, of thoughts and emotions and feelings and memories and so on. Opening up to the fact that each moment the mind can be completely different and that's okay. 
each moment we can be a completely different person than we were the previous moment, and that's okay. Each moment there can be a completely different personality present than in the previous moment, and that's okay, because it's not who we are. It's just another temporary, insubstantial, impermanent, continually changing thing. It's not even a thing. And looking at the mind in the same way. So looking beneath the objects of mind to the, the backdrop of the mind, the, uh, what we might call the, the canvas of the mind on which all the objects are painted, so the surface of the mind uh, on which things appear. Uh, so it's like when a, a, a movie is projected onto a screen. Uh, we're not looking at the movie, we're looking at the screen itself. Uh, at the, the fabric of the screen, at its, its ripples, its surface, its texture. And recognizing that that's not who we are either. That's not stable either. That's not permanent either. That also is constantly changing. That also is insubstantial. It has that same peculiar quality of simultaneous existence and non-existence, just as the body does. So it's opening up to the continual shift and change of consciousness itself. It's opening up to the impermanence of consciousness itself, to the uh, fluctuation uh, of consciousness, to its appearing and disappearing, its arising and vanishing. So this is actually what the Buddha was talking about when he spoke about mindfulness. Uh, so when we read the the Discourse on the Establishment of Mindfulness, you'll notice that in each section, uh, the Buddha always says, one notices it's arising, it's vanishing, it's arising and vanishing, uh, and uh, one does not cling to it. So one, one does not hold on to anything in the whole world. One does not grasp anything. Uh, so this is when the Buddha is talking about mindfulness. So this is why I say mindfulness is so much more than just awareness. Uh, it's because it's not just awareness of things. That would actually be delusion. Awareness of things is delusion. There are no things. So if you're aware of things, you're not practicing mindfulness, you're practicing delusion. <laughs> if you're practicing mindfulness of the body as though there's actually a stable, ongoing, existing body, then you're not practicing mindfulness, as the Buddha talked about it. You're just reifying the concept, uh, or the, the misperception of the world that's kept us trapped for so long. So when the Buddha talks about mindfulness, he incorporates this recognition of impermanence. Uh, he incorporates the practice of non-attachment, uh, of, of relinquishing this tightly held grasp that we have on this delusion of permanent, stable, solid, independent objects. So as we develop this practice, uh, again, we start to notice a transformation in our experience. Uh, we notice, uh, as I mentioned before, a feeling of deep security, of fearlessness, of recognizing that there's absolutely nothing to fear. Because any scenario that could possibly happen, what is it? It's just change. But we're totally okay with change, aren't we? Uh, we're practicing the direct perception of the continual change of every single component of our experience, body and mind. So any change within body and mind is something that's completely acceptable. So no potential scenario can bother us. One of the epithets of the enlightened ones is the, the fearless ones, those who have no fear. Sound good to anyone? Anyone want to be completely free of fear? No trace of it in the mind? Sound good? 
few people? Great. Okay. You'll also notice a pervasive bliss, a pervasive joy. You'll also notice clarity, um, a deep sense of confidence. Uh, that no matter what people say or how they try to convince you otherwise, um, you know for yourself that this is the, the nature of things. You know for yourself that this is how things are because you've seen it. You've felt it. Um, you've felt the underlying fabric which reality is, is made of. You've felt the underlying substance which all things are made of. So that, that peculiar experience of touching both existence and non-existence, of touching that mm, grayness, that... Mm, mm, again, what's, what's called emptiness, this, this thing which is neither existent nor non-existent, which neither has form nor lacks form. Uh, which simultaneously contains all potential forms. Once, once we start to touch that, we start to recognize that this is what all things arise from. Uh, and that's something which nobody can convince us otherwise of, because how could they? Their attempt to convince us otherwise is simply one of the infinite manifestations of this, this formlessness, this emptiness. Uh, so there's a deep unshakable confidence in our recognition of uh, an underlying fundamental truth of reality. So this is where we start to finally, at last, talk about faith in a Buddhist context. Um, so it's not the faith that comes from hearing somebody in a weird outfit and no hair talk for an hour about some strange philosophical concepts. That's not faith. Just believing what somebody tells you is not faith in a Buddhist sense. That's just foolishness. But directly experiencing an absolutely incontrovertible experience of the, uh, of the fabric of reality. That's true faith. Uh, because there's no way it can be, it can be shown to be otherwise. So any attempt to show it to be otherwise is simply one of its manifestations. Um, so then, uh, with that deep confidence that we've touched uh, a deep inherent truth of the way things are, uh, then we know we're on the right track. And that's not something that can be taken away from us. So at this point, we've arrived at the first, well, if we reach this point, then we'll have arrived at the first stage of awakening. Um, and there's still more work to be done, but if you can get that far, you're on very, very good ground, uh, or rather very good groundlessness, um, uh, because it's, it's irreversible at that point. So anything that happens at that point, you'll recognize is simply being uh, a manifestation of, uh, of emptiness, a manifestation of formlessness. Um, so you won't be bothered, you won't be thrown off track. There's nothing that can throw you off track at that point. There's nothing that can shake your confidence uh, that you're on the right track. So what I'm demonstrating here is how what seems to be a, a relatively simple practice of sit down, focus on your hands, notice things are changing. Sounds, sounds like a really simple practice. Uh, but put into its proper context uh, within uh, Buddhist theory, uh, then we can recognize how this seemingly simple meditation practice is uh, a way of moving us towards uh, genuine enlightenment, genuine awakening, towards a radical transformation in our experience that produces, again, not just a, a slightly better 
experience, but a completely qualitatively different experience of reality. So one in which there are no solid objects, and yet there's still the appearance of solid objects. So the mind can juggle these two things without any conflict. Uh, and the mind can recognize then that whatever arises within the world of, of forms of stable objects uh, is perfectly okay. Uh, the mind doesn't need to be bothered or disturbed by any of it. Uh, it can recognize that, that it all has its place, it all has its, uh, its reason for manifesting. Um, so there's no need to be disturbed by it. Uh, and we recognize that uh, as things shift and change, um, that we don't lose uh, our capacity for joy. We don't lose our capacity for, for genuine happiness and contentment, because that's not dependent upon any particular configuration of, of objects. Um, so we're touching a unshakable serenity, an unshakable clarity, uh, an unshakable mm, happiness, which is completely different from our ordinary experience of uh, agitation, of turmoil, of this restless seeking of pleasant experiences, this restless avoiding of unpleasant experiences, this constant um, agitated, uncomfortable struggle to get what we want and avoid what we don't want. Uh, we step out of that completely. We step back from that completely uh, into the ground of uh, unshakable serenity. I think I've spoken for long enough. Um, any questions or comments? Isn't there such a thing as a skillful fear like fear of wrongdoing? So I don't personally believe that the translation fear of wrongdoing is a correct translation for uh, an otapa. Um, so the Pali words hiri and otapa uh, refer to conscience, the ability to recognize wholesome and unwholesome. Um, so that has nothing to do with fear, uh, or shame, or dread, or any of the other phenomenally inaccurate translations which have sometimes been used for those words. Probably the best I've come across is conscience. Um, yeah, I've seen a couple others which are vaguely close but don't quite get it. Um, even conscience is not perfect, but it's, it's the closest I've seen. Wait, um, I read that. Like, one definition of Bhikkhu is one who sees the danger of samsara. So that's called folk etymology. It has no validity in actual linguistics. Um, it's very cute, but it's not quite accurate as an etymology. Uh, nonetheless, as a uh, guideline to practice, it has some validity. So if we define samsara as the distorted, delusional misperception of the world that we normally inhabit, then recognizing the danger in inhabiting that distorted, delusional misperception leads one to sincerely practicing uh, for the development of true wisdom. Um, so that actually is valid as a guideline for practice. So even though Linguistically, it's not accurate. Uh, it still has its place. Um, so the Buddha talks about seeing the danger in samsara in many places in the suttas. Um, so it's recognizing that uh, you can never find happiness by seeking what you want. That will just keep you looking forever. We find happiness by seeking, or ceasing to seek.
Okay. Any other questions? about if one had a choice of identifying with the body or mind siding with the body because it's a more stable continuous object I don't know if that understanding is correct but I was wondering if you could perhaps elaborate on that and how that relates to uh, the discussion of the evening mm -hmm. well I actually tend to think of that in terms of stabilizing the mind um, so it's that when you pin the mind to something, uh, so pinning the mind to the body helps to make, to make the mind more steady, um, so that the mind is not all over the place. Uh, so that's useful when we're developing concentration. So actually when we're developing concentration, from one perspective we're, we're reifying the appearance of solidity, uh, but we're doing so in order to settle down the mind uh, and to develop this sharp, clear awareness so that we can then dissolve the appearance of solidity. Uh, but in the beginning, that apparent stability is useful uh, for getting the mind under control uh, so that we're not just thrashing all over the place as we normally do. Um, so that's what comes to mind for me as to what, what the Buddha might have been referring to in that case. Yeah, he speaks at one point about how, like, from moment to moment the mind would be so, like, totally different, whereas the body at least is relatively to that, a little bit more stable. Um, oh, it appears to be, until you start paying close attention. Then you realize it's not stable for even an instant. So it's, so it's taking something that appears to be stable to use that to settle down and then pierce that delusion that there's anything stable at all. Right. Like the launch point. Right, exactly. Anything else? So it's important to be persistent in our practice. Uh, to really put a sincere effort into what we're doing. Uh, if we don't try, or if we only give it a half-hearted effort, we won't, we won't get very far. We won't notice significant results. Uh, so like people talk a lot about jhana as though jhana was this mystical, remote thing which is almost impossible and... Uh, well, actually it's not. Just try really hard and you'll get jhana. If you don't try really hard, you won't. It's really as simple as that. So it's the same with, with all of our, our, our practice. If we try really hard, we'll get it. If we don't try really hard, we probably won't. Um, we'll, get, we'll get some effect, we'll get some benefit. Um, but if we really want to radically transform the mind, we need to try really, really hard. Uh, and there's, there's, really, there's really no getting around this. We, we can't just float through our practice. Um, if we do, then we'll just be battered around by all of the, the underlying tendencies of mind. Uh, so our practice is more like, like swimming upstream. Uh, in fact, the Buddha spoke about uh, the, practice, uh, the practice of Buddhism as going against the stream of the world. It's going against the current. It's not easy. Uh, we need to make a powerful, continual effort. 
Uh, if we stop trying, then we'll just be swept along. And actually, usually, we're, it's not just that we're being swept along, we're actually usually swimming with the current. Um, we're usually just going with our desires and our aversions, uh, which just makes things worse, which just, just re-emphasizes the problem. So it's important to really try. Like when we practice meditation, uh, don't tolerate even a moment of distraction. Don't tolerate even a moment uh, of, of spaciness or even a moment of restless thinking or even a moment of anything other than the meditation practice. Um, so really making the most of it. Uh, because otherwise, uh, we'll just keep spinning in circles for eons, as we have been. Isn't that scary? What's that? Isn't that scary? Oh, if the fear helps motivate you, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, do you have a question? So I found Audrey Sacito um, very helpful on several points of what you said, the connection between existence and non existence. Mm -hmm. When he has that very body oriented meditation, um, boundaries become fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And so, in terms of connecting to the reality of this hand, it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that our high level or in terms of quantum mechanics, well, forget that word. In terms of when he talks about what is it that lets you really have a body, there's pressures and sensations that are all flow away. And actually, because there's a continuous surface, this, you know, this air is adjacent to this and it moves along with me, right? There, there's a probability of, of, of where each of those layers is. But he also talks about the joy and that you can taste if you sit with the body. It's rather delightful. And once again, I can't even think of reproducing it without two or three of those very meditations right, that he has. I, can't, I can get a moment or two, but it's not worth it to me because the joy comes in. Um, it's not worth it to me to go without listening to that, even if I don't have the whole time. And you can probably direct people to make those up. It's not subtle. Story of hiking along early in his practice. He heard this two small boots, and his feet were bloody, and he could not notice. Mm -hmm. Not just possibly to his sense. But he, and then Andre Biardano said the same thing to me all the time. The joy is very motivating. In one session where you feel that slight abatement of sense desire, because it's so pleasant. And it's not that it happens every time, and my mind is poster child for the long term mind. But I think if there's a draconian, you know, if you don't keep your mind steady every moment, one can't. We're starting as beginners. But that direction, that's how I interpreted faith. I was that believe they're not in the as a little one. Um, the faith is, is comes from a little bit in my case progress. And not attaching to the progress, I couldn't because it's so inconsistent. But you feel better. Starting with the empirical, I think, is tremendously helpful. We're such a heady culture. The philosophic stuff is so nice, so pleasant to think in terms of philosophy and logic and very testable. And so I just, I say this and can't hold on to it, just why I articulate it. If there's anyone out there that's very, you know, demanding oneself or goal oriented and so on. There is a little bit of joy and it's really lovely. Yeah. It's actually a lot of joy. Yeah. Well but for you yes. <laughs> <It's not really. laughs> I, mean, I, I lay in bed and like, okay, there's joy, there's joy, there's joy, there's joy, there's joy, and I manage to sit up. And then, you know it, but he's really good. I'm kind of a he just it's ridiculous if you want to well this one had these things on a tatami on a sheet and I like the powers of like it's like thirteen. But that even becomes so you can taste the joy and relaxing. I'm not my pain. It's going to sit there and you know, it just sits there. It moves around all the places. It gets to go all kinds of places. And at some point, that relaxes. Your words were very good for that. You know, I finish it all over the place. Because this, you can't really trust it. You can trust it, it sits still. I'm trying 
interesting. But I just wanted to say the whole joy part because that that's what keeps me going. It's those little tiny bits of joy. And the failures, like it's funny. I'm, I can possibly make, you know, I don't tolerate them on longer and longer, but it's just, there's that joke. That's a bit, how does an ADD mom jump screw in a light bulb? Oh, look at the bird. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, and it's important to remember that um, ultimately what we're aiming at in our practice is unconditional happiness. Uh, but that every step along the way we notice a difference. Uh, we notice improvement. Um, so there's always something to encourage us if we look for it. Um, so Ajahn Yatiko, uh, uh, many, many years ago, he, uh, he said that at the end of every meditation period we should stop and reflect on how different the mind is than before we started practicing. Um, even over the course of a half hour of meditation, we can notice a bit of improvement. Uh, and if we've been practicing for years or decades, then we can notice how we've improved over that period of time. So it's taking that moment to remind ourselves uh, to really draw attention to the, the joy, the serenity, the, the happiness that comes from our practice. Uh, which gives us um, that, that encouragement to keep going. Uh, but it's also recognizing that, uh, again, I was, I was emphasizing putting in sincere effort because that joy comes from sincere effort. Uh, the times when we sit down and we just spend the whole time thinking about um, our plans and our, and our finances and, and our worries and this and that, well, at the end of it, well, we're, we're still all mixed up inside. But the times when we make a really sincere effort in our practice, then at the end we notice, oh, I actually feel a lot better now. Um, so the times when I've had really strong concentration, where I've experienced just absolutely mind-blowing euphoria, wasn't the time when I was just spacing out and thinking about mm, the novel I want to write or whatever. It was the times when I was like, I'm going to focus on my body and I'm going to keep my mind on my body. And I did. Uh, and then things start to change. Um, so it's that confidence that comes from direct experience, the confidence that comes from knowing when I really try, I really get mind-blowing results. Uh, and if we've never gotten mind-blowing results, well then it's time to really put our heart and soul into it and see what happens. Um, if you've never done a week-long retreat, do a week-long retreat. If you've never done a month-long retreat, do a month-long retreat. If you've never done three months, do three months. Um, it's always always pushing it a bit. Um, and seeing what happens when we go a little bit farther than we're used to. Uh, if you've sat for half an hour, sit for 45 minutes. If you've sat for that, sit for an hour. If you've sat for an hour, sit for two or three. Um, if you've never sat for three or four hours straight, it's time. See what happens. It's miserable for the first half, but stick with it. With serenity, and things change. Make an effort, and things change. Anyway, uh, it's time to stop for the evening. Yeah? That's very good.